So in this episode of Mind Pump, we talked all about uh, one of the most popular body parts that people want to develop. Both sexes. There's there's a, a few body parts that both men and women prize uh, quite a bit. And this one is the shoulders. So we talk all about your shoulders. Now we start out by talking about the structure of the shoulders, the different joints that make up the shoulder, why the shoulder joint is so damn mobile. It's one of the most mobile parts of your upper body. Why did we evolve to have such incredible shoulders and what kind of injuries affect the shoulders? Then we talk about the aesthetics of the shoulders, what they make the body look like, how they can make your waist look smaller, how they can make you appear more attractive. And then we get into the fun part. We break down the shoulder uh, anatomy and how to train the shoulders. We talk about mobility movements that you can do for your shoulders to improve your range of motion so you build better muscles and so you don't injure yourself. And then we talk about specific exercises, rep ranges, and how often you should work out your shoulders. We also wrote a guide around training shoulders that you can download for free. If you wait till the end of the episode, we tell you where, how to get it. Some freebies in this one, Sal. So this one's awesome. You're going to you're gonna, you're gonna leave with a workout for your shoulders and some more free information. Before the episode starts, I'd like to remind everybody that MAPS Starter is 50% off. Now, MAPS Starter is our workout program for people who want to get started with resistance training. This is for people who want to reap all the benefits that weight training can provide. Faster metabolism, sculpting the body, of course, toned muscles or sculpted muscles. Um, it's half off right now. You can find it at mapsstarter.com. That's M-A-P-S-S-T-A-R-T-E-R.com. You have to use the code STARTER50 for the discount. That's S-T-A-R-T-E-R-5-0, no space, for the discount. Let's talk about the shoulder, the muscles of the shoulder, the shoulder function. Where Let's is get it? Into it. <laughs> Let's yeah. start out by talking about where the shoulder is. Right. No, you know why it's important? Because can you think of a body part? There's a few body parts that are equally prized by both men and women. Like, you know, there's certain body parts that are more prized by women, more prized by men. But then there's those body parts that you get both sides. Like, I Crossover. really want to work. Yeah. Yeah. And shoulders is the first one. That comes to mind when I think of that. I yeah. would I would say that a close second would be the arms, but most of the people that I've trained that wanted great arms, when I explained to them if we were to build great shoulders, it would make their arms look more yeah, impressive. It's part of the arms, right? And they once they piece that together, like because you can have great arms, but if you have terrible shoulders in a tank top, they look it looks terrible. No, now the shoulders. Here's the thing about the shoulder joint. Um, it's the most. It's one of the most mobile joints in the human body. It's made up of, there's four joints that make up the, the shoulder joint. Um, there's the, and these are the technical term, uh, terms, but there's a glenohumeral joint, the acromioclavicular joint, the sternoclavicular joint, and the scapulothoracic joint. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts. And, you know, we got to ask ourselves, like, why is the shoulder joint so mobile? Because you could literally rotate your arm Mm -hmm. internally, externally. You could reach up above Overhead, your head, yeah. go to your out to your side, in front of you, behind you. You can push, pull, lift things. It's this extremely mobile, versatile joint. And you gotta ask yourself, like, why? Why are human why are human why do humans have such incredibly mobile shoulder joints? Right. Um, now the first hint is the fact that we evolved from primates that probably lived in trees. So obviously if you're swinging in trees and hanging all the time, you need some some decent mobility. But that doesn't really answer the full question in terms of why the human shoulder joint is constructed or at least why we evolved to have it look the way it, uh, it does. And there's something that we do better than any other animal. There's a couple things we do better than any other animal. One of them one of the, is throw with incredible accuracy. No animal on earth can throw with as much accuracy as easily as humans can. I mean, you can train animals to throw with some level of accuracy, but you could take like, you could take a five-year-old kid, you could give him a, a balled up piece of paper and tell him to throw it inside a, a garbage, you know, a waste basket. And most five-year-olds will get pretty damn close if not hit it. Yeah. Then it gets as extreme as like throwing a 90 mile an hour fastball that fits in a box that's about 17 inches wide and maybe about a couple feet tall. Like, 
That's incredible. That's ridiculous. The closest I've seen is a chimpanzee throwing some some poop. Poop. Yeah. That's about it. Now, yeah. what what's the reason for that though? Because their shoulders are technically just as mobile, if not more mobile than ours. It, it, but it's different. It's a different mm. kind of mobility. Our shoulder joints are designed. Right. To- you gave that great example the other day about they didn't they have a, like a chimp go through the. Uh, with mm-hmm. that one course, the mm-hmm. uh, American Ninja, American Ninja Warrior, and he, yes. like, crushed everybody. Mm-hmm. Yes. So they have, I mean, they have incredible mobility in their shoulder. They do, but you got to ask yourself, why do hu- modern humans have th- incredible mobility? We don't swing from trees uh, yeah. like, They're like in range. monkeys do. Yeah, you know, strength is really impressive. Yeah, we don't do that, right? So why do humans, why do modern humans, we, we left the trees... A long time ago, long, long, long time ago, did we leave the trees and we were ground dwelling primates well, or whatever? I mean, when you when you talk about the main functions, push, pull, lift, rotate, and you can do that in every plane with the shoulder. You can, and then and then the fact that we could throw, and that's what made us apex predators was the ability to throw. Mm-hmm. So we evolved to keep this incredibly mobile joint that we no longer needed from swinging for swinging, but now we used for. Obviously, our daily functions, but then throwing. Now, there's some, there's some. That's that. Those are some of the positives. Like that's awesome. It's great that we have this joint that's extremely mobile. But here's the negatives: with extreme mobility comes high risk for instability. Well, especially when when you're talking about evolution and how we've evolved, especially in the last hundred years, we're doing less and less. Totally. Nobody's nobody's running out somewhere with a spear yeah. and killing their prey. I mean, that's like. Nobody is doing that. No, and, and so very few people are even lifting things all the way above their head anymore. Yeah, all the way to full extension over their head. That doesn't really happen in your day to day life anymore. It's no, crazy. No, I, I can't tell you how many times I had clients that. Well, I'd say a majority of my clients who were over, I'd say forty, were not able to get a full their arms fully extended up above their head with nice mobility. They could reach up above their head, but not with full extension. Once I got to 50, 60, 70, then the majority of them couldn't even reach up uh, above their head. So it was actually quite common because we're born with these joints that are supposed to be extremely mobile. But if you don't strengthen all the ranges of motion and stay connected to them, then all you have is a very unstable joint. I mean, if you look at injuries, for example, the most common areas that people hurt themselves are the the back. Mm -hmm. And the, the spine is extremely mobile too, right? The spine twists and bends in all these different directions. And then you look at the shoulder. The shoulder is extremely common to have problems. In fact, it's one of the most common surgeries that orthopedic surgeons will have to work on are shoulder uh, issues. And this is for everyday people. We're not even talking about athletes. Yeah, and and you notice too as you look at people as they age. Like This is one of those old adages is like, oh, the gravity is kind of pulling me closer to the ground and you just kind of shrimp and curl forward just naturally because we're doing everything in front of us. And so if you're not conscious of like pulling yourself back in, in good posture, it can really get away from you to where your body does sort of form into that uh, forward uh, movement. Well, they, they say one in every four people in their lifetime will deal with major shoulder chronic pain. That's a lot. That is a lot. Yeah. I mean, one of us, right, that, based off of that, someone in this room right now will have that if they haven't already. I know you've had surgery. I had shoulder surgery. I had my, uh, my AC joint, the acromioclavicular joint, resected. And one of the biggest problems with that is what happens, and I know you guys have experience this with clients also is once they start to feel this chronic pain, whether it be this kind of clicking feeling they feel or this kind of sharp pain or this kind of nagging dull pain, they stop, they yeah. stop doing back off. Yeah. They back away from it in fear of injuring it worse or making it worse than it already is. But then they don't do anything to get back to that point. Right. Yeah. And yeah. that, and that results in less and less mobility over time because whatever mm-hmm. you don't, Whatever you don't do, you don't stay connected to. So if, you know, yeah, if you don't use it, you lose it. hundred percent. So if you and that's an old fitness adage, but it's so true, right? Like, yeah, it still holds. Totally holds. Like if you stop walking right now, let's say you just decided you're just going to be in a chair uh, for the next fifteen years. So for fifteen years you don't walk. How do you think you're going to walk as soon as you get up out of that chair? It's going to be very difficult. You'll have lost a lot of the not just the strength. Um, and that that you because you weren't using those muscles, but also the coordination and the connection, the skill of walking. And now the reason why I want to make this point um, so strongly is because 
you have to approach your work, even if your your goal is just aesthetics, even if your goal is just to have amazing looking shoulders, understand and appreciate that this is a very mobile joint and that there are lots of functions of the joint and that there's more, there's lots of moving parts because that'll make your workouts far more effective. If you know this and understand this, then you will develop better shoulders through your workouts. Because here's the big thing with shoulders. Here's a big one when it comes to aesthetics. The way people tend to train their shoulders, Adam, how often do you see guys and girls do traditional workouts and develop shoulders that just don't look balanced? Right. They just don't get that round, nice look to their shoulders. Well, all the time. And that's you're, you're, and this is one of the things. I think these shoulders are probably one of the most common areas that you see that because what ends up happening is all these other muscles start to take over a movement that the, the primary mover should have been the anterior delt or the posterior delt, whatever movement we're talking about. But because they're, they have immobile shoulders or they have poor posture and they're still trying to perform the movement, the body doesn't know any better. So it just uh, – other muscles are going to take over to help mm -hmm. and assist it, which then results in the shoulder not developing optimally. So right. not only just optimally for performance, but also optimally for aesthetics. Right, right. And when you're looking at uh, an area or a muscle, and if that muscle represents a lot of mobility, like lots and lots of mobility – like if we look at the elbow joint, for example – the elbow joint bends and extends, so that's the that's the mobility of the elbow joint. Basically it's not a, a hinge. It's not a whole lot, right? Uh, but if you look at the shoulder joint, it moves in so many different directions. This is where applying different angles and exercises makes a ton of sense. It right. makes a ton of sense because there's so many different ranges of motion. There's so many different planes of movement and actions that you can and should strengthen. The side effect of which will be great looking shoulders balanced round looking shoulders that also are very functional and functions important well, you know functions huge and and that's why I'm always talking about that with the shoulders because I know a lot of people really want that balanced look aesthetically but in order to to make sure everything's functioning properly you need to have those checks and balances you need to have those opposing muscles to be able to keep everything in its proper position so that way it doesn't lead to impingements it doesn't lead to these problems later where you overdevelop say your anterior deltoid and now it's pulling you off track so now your arm you're starting to lose mobility you're starting to lose a lot of things and, and you're getting these these painful clicking and all these things that that result of it just not being set up properly yeah i can't tell you how many times i would have um, people in the gym, uh, regulars, who looked fit, relatively lean, muscular, um, and then I wouldn't see them for a while. And then they come in and I'd be like, what happened? Oh, I had, I hurt my shoulder. Oh, was it while you were working out? No, I was throwing the Frisbee around with my kid or throwing a baseball or, you know, I, I, I almost fell and I caught myself and then I hurt my shoulder. Right. It was all, it was all because they lacked uh, functionality. They didn't have the real good functional strength. And so that's an important thing to look at. Even if you don't really care about being an athlete or you don't care about throwing a baseball or a, or, or a Frisbee, at the end of the day, the thing that will prevent you from looking your best faster than anything else is an injury. You know, if you get injured, there goes your workout. So it's an important thing to pay attention to. On the flip side, pay attention to functionality. And what I mean is by all the ranges of motion that the shoulders can, can, can do, develops a, a full-looking, round-looking, balanced-looking shoulder. You get this, this nice, balanced look. And it's not just the look of the shoulder itself. It's also in the way the, the shoulders are carried. So when you look at people – I mean, how many times have you guys seen these people in the gym that are muscular? Super rounded fit, forward. But they just – they don't look like they're put together well. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're walking around and, and they're stiff and, and, yeah, it doesn't look like they, their abilities are there as look well. At their, look at their thumbs. You see this a lot of times with oh, big buff guys, yeah. and I, it's like a, it's a real easy telltale if you look at the way they walk. And a lot of times you'll see people that have major anterior delt, a lot of overdevelopment in their shoulders. They'll have this like internal rotation of their their thumb. So mm -hmm. if I look at the way they walk, their hands, the way they're positioned, they're kind of rotated in, yeah. and you can just see when they walk around, they have that kind of like gorilla look when they walk around. And everybody makes fun of that, but yeah. that's what that's from. It's from that. They already have this like protracted shoulder girdle, and then on top of that, they overdevelop the delts, and then and that's just not only does it not look great, but it's it's setting you up for long term. Yeah, you can't probably, wipe your ass anymore. Yeah, you know, long term. <laughs> that's a problem. Chronic pain. That's the other part too about the importance of the shoulder, the shoulder girdle, 
and the ability to control it and put it in the, the, the right position because it has a lot to do with how well you work your chest and how well you work your back also. Because if you – like, remember how I covered the four joints of the, of the shoulder? People don't realize that the, the shoulder blade is a big part of the shoulder function. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's lots of muscles that attach to the shoulder blade that have to do with your back. Right, yeah. And if your back is weak – you're not going to develop nice shoulders. If you don't have good stability in the front of your body, I talked about two joints, the acromioclavicular joint and the sternoclavicular joint. Those are the joints on either side of your collarbone. So if right. you look at your collarbone, there's two, two, two collarbones, if you will. On one end, there's one joint. On the other end, there's another joint. Those play a role in your shoulder as well. And so if you don't have good development in the front of your body or good function in the front of your body, that will also affect your shoulder joint. So I think what I'm trying to do is make the case that your shoulder joint is very mobile and very complex, and it will require more than just a yeah. couple basic Lots exercises. Lots of attention. Well, yes. and and the and to my point, the 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 better you can control it, and the better mobility you have there, the better you're probably going to have a better development in your chest and your back also. Mm-hmm. Because if you're very unstable in your shoulders, or you're extremely tight. What ends up happening is that that it, that's, it starts there, but then it carries over to this imbalance on a chest. Mm-hmm. I mean, how often have you seen this before where somebody has uh, one side of their chest more developed than the other side? Mm-hmm. And a lot of times that has little to do with the actual chest muscle itself and actually the shoulder. They have the inability to keep the, the shoulder on the side of the underdeveloped muscle. They have the inability to keep that shoulder in the retracted position when they're doing chest exercise. Right, right. So... Not only is the, the the mobility and strength and function of the shoulder so important for the shoulder itself, but it's also very important to the development of the other muscles that are around it, like the chest and the back, which are two massive muscles that are responsible for us looking incredible and also for daily function of pushing and pulling. It, it's so. extremely important. It's an extremely port, important joint, and and the muscle function is very important for everything, pretty much everything you do. And forget about being an athlete. If you're an athlete, you, you need to have good working It's shoulders. crucial if Absolutely. you're an athlete. So, yeah, I mean, I would stress that almost – over anything besides like yeah maybe your hips and, and ankle but but definitely your shoulder needs so much more attention because of the fact that you know all these rotating moves and uh you know like all these shearing forces you have to account for all these things and so you have to have a very balanced shoulder that can resist a lot of these forces and we, you guys are talking performance and i could talk all day aesthetics about it right but i mean this is why this i like this topic because Um, Whether you're someone who's concerned about the way your physique looks, uh, hands down, there's never been, this is true story, there's never been a bikini competitor, men's physique, bodybuilder, anybody that I've trained in that that sport, that shoulders wasn't one of the main focuses of Mm -hmm. our program. And then an athlete, to your point, Justin, that's an absolute must. I don't care what sport you're playing, uh, shoulder uh, stability, uh, mobility, strength is extremely important. And then the last one, which is I think the everybody else, is just overall daily function. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're talking about one of the most important things. You're going to have to carry things. You're going to have to pull things. You're going to have to push things. You're going to have to lift things above your head. And I think a lot of people just neglect that or, again, they feel a little bit of a chronic pain, and then they decide to just avoid it. When it's- and sometimes the pain isn't in the shoulder if you have a problem with the shoulder. Sometimes right. it's in your neck. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of neck tightness oftentimes comes from lack of shoulder mobility. I can't tell you how many times I've worked on shoulder mobility with a client who has neck pain, and the neck pain starts to go away because mm-hmm. their shoulders are, are working. But because the body compensates, right? If one thing isn't working, something else has to take over. Now, we got to ask ourselves why, why the shoulders are such an aesthetic focal point for both men and women. Um, it's because well-developed shoulders for thousands and thousands of years represented health. They just did. Um, just like a, a tight mid- midsection is something that we all like looking at, that also is a visual representation of well, health. Well, and to that point, <laughs> the shoulders create that illusion. Oh, totally. So even if you don't tighten up your midsection, if you do build the shoulders, mm-hmm. it creates the illusion of the, the smaller midsection. And I think you've touched on this before, Sal, of... They have already done what surveys or whatever on this to prove that it, there, we have this common thing of the, the shoulder to waist ratio. Right, the There's yeah. a shoulder to waist to hip ratio that is considered ideal in both men and women. It's not the same ratio, but there's there's a ratio for men and a ratio for women. And we just when that ratio was hit, we we think the person looks 
more attractive. And it's because, and we've tied it to, to studies that show that women who have this ratio have better, uh, you know, are easier births and have healthier babies. Men who tend to have this ratio tend to have higher testosterone levels, tend to have higher sperm counts. So it's, it's interesting. It is weird, right? That we, now, I mean, you can fool the, you know, people by, you know, doing weird things to your body or whatever. But if you do this the right way and you're healthy and you develop nice looking shoulders, the bottom line is you're just going to look more attractive. You're just going to look more attractive to everybody. So this is why, one of the reasons why shoulders are, I think, so valued among uh, both sexes. Um, so I think that we've, now that we've kind of made the case and talked a little bit about the shoulder, I think we should talk about exercise or, well, or what go, we should do with them. Well, before you go there, we should actually, because we talked all about the, the joints and mobility and all the, the functions, but there's we should talk about the, the parts of the shoulder right? And, and really what they're responsible for. And then what I think some people neglect a lot. For example, um, and I think I've shared this story a long time ago on the podcast, uh, I'll, I'll never forget this. It was like in my early twenties and I had already been lifting for some years now. And I kind of came from this camp of, you know, when you do pushing exercises like chest and I did a lot of chest stuff, you get some of your anterior delts incorporated. That's the when, front of the shoulder, right? The front of the shoulder. Uh, when you do a lot of back stuff, rowing and stuff, you get some of the back of the shoulder, posterior, uh, part of the shoulder, uh, and then I would occasionally throw some laterals in, but I never like really targeted mm -hmm. my shoulders. And I remember one time, and this was way before I'd ever even thought about competing or anything like that at all. And I had a, uh, one of my trainers who worked for me, she was a professional competitor and I wanted her professional opinion on my physique. And, uh, she said to me, and I remember she had this thick accent. She says, Oh, Adam, you have, uh, weak shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like super offended by it <laughs> you know, because because at that point, um, I thought of my shoulders as my arms and I had these big, massive arms and she really kind of like broke it down to me. She says, no, you've, she says, you have these great, impressive arms, but terrible shoulders. It makes your arms look slope. And she totally picked me apart and it just <laughs> destroyed my ego. But it really set me on this path of like, okay, starting to develop my shoulders. And I started training just my shoulders. And before that, I'd never trained my shoulders alone by themselves. And it's funny because later on, and this is years later of putting a lot of emphasis on building my shoulders. And because of that, all the emphasis on the shoulders, I laid off of all the crazy emphasis that I was putting on my biceps and my triceps. I actually lost a couple, you know, probably an inch and a half or so on my arms, but built these developed shoulders. And I used to get compliments all the time now on, on, my, arms. on my arms. <laughs> mm. and, and when I look back now on pictures of way back then, uh, and then pictures that are more recent, and, and of course, when I was competing and stuff, that's what I, one of the things I was known for uh, was my, my V taper, my back, my back width. And part of that, it was exaggerated because of the development that I put in my shoulders. And the number one thing for me personally and I, I notice this common with a lot of people is uh, neglecting the rear delts mm -hmm. uh, and not targeting them uh, correctly. And I think that's because it's a it's a very small muscle, and because it's on the it's on the back side posterior, uh, uh, the back muscles tend to want to take over most of the movements that people see. So people see a movement like a rear fly, for example, which is a great exercise for the rear delts. The problem is it's not that far different from a row if you don't understand the mechanics of it. And really easily you can let like your traps and your rhomboids to start to take over that movement and they end up developing more and then the rear delts don't get developed that yeah. much. It's also it's also because the, the the most common shoulder exercises that you hear about typically aren't posterior uh you know head exercises. It's right. typically lots of presses, overhead presses. And overhead presses are phenomenal for the shoulders, but they don't work the posterior head of the deltoid very much at all. And so they tend to be very underdeveloped. And an underdeveloped posterior head of the deltoid makes your shoulders look like they're um, you're, you're, you're forward heavy. You're sloping forward. It gives you that, it emphasizes that forward shoulder look, that, you know, that bad posture look or whatever. There's three heads of the, of, of the, of the sh shoulder that we'll focus on here. Now there's lots of muscles that stabilize and work around those different joints that we talked about. But for the sake of this podcast, we're going to focus on just the muscles of the shoulder, the shoulder itself. 
That's the anterior head of the deltoid, so that's the front of the shoulder. There's the lateral head of the shoulder, the, the side head, and then the posterior head, which is the one in the back. Those three parts of the shoulder, develop those well, and you'll get the really round shoulders. Develop one over the others, and you start to look kind of imbalanced. Now, before we get into the exercises that I think we should, we should recommend to people and kind of give people like a, a workout, a little workout they can do on their own, I think we need to make a point to talk about um, working on and maintaining good mobility mm -hmm. first. Hands down, yes. one of the, the best, and this really, even when I was training like, I mean, just probably seven, eight years ago, this piece hadn't clicked for me. Um, but once I started to dive into mobility work and, in, and addressing this, and I soon, and I remember when we first started the podcast, uh, Sal. I know you and I would talk a lot about this, having to spend like twenty minutes before workouts of like really addressing like all of our issues before we go into lifting. But I started to notice a, a big difference, not only in the development of my shoulders, but also just how I felt throughout the workout. Just I could feel, I could get, I got these better pumps. I didn't feel any pain because I before I had noticed like clicking noises and things that would kind of freak me out when I was exercising. When I started putting uh, emphasis on mobility before I started training, I really started to notice a huge difference in my development. And I noticed any sort of those weird clicking noises or small uh, sharp pain you sometimes get in the front of your shoulder. Mm -hmm. I completely eliminated all of that when I take the time and do the mobility before I train. Now, besides injury, besides lack of pain or, or reducing pain and injury, here's why it's important to strengthen and work on mobility. Uh, and mobility, we could say, is basically longer. Uh, improving mobility would be increasing your range of motion that you have control over. Okay, So to give you an easy example, uh, let's say I go down to touch my toes and I can barely get my fingertips to touch my toes. That's my, that's my mobility for my hamstrings. Okay, and I, and I can control it all. I'm not talking about passive stretch. Like I'm actually doing the stretch myself. If I get that to go longer, now I can, when I go to touch my toes, I can put my hands flat on my feet, but I still have control over that range of motion. I have better mobility. I have a longer range of motion. Okay, why is that important for muscle development, for all muscles? Studies show quite conclusively that the longer ranges of motion that you train in, the more muscle you develop, mm -hmm. okay? This is why a full squat done properly. I'm going to say that again because I want to make sure nobody hurts themselves. You got to have control over this range of motion. This is why mobility work is so important. But a full squat done properly will build better legs and glutes than a half squat done properly. A shoulder press with a fuller range of motion going down to the upper chest, all the way fully extended, all the way up with the head coming forward, nice straight body, will develop better shoulders than a partial rep uh, shoulder press, both of them being done properly, both of them with good control. The longer range of motion just works better. So if you want to develop better shoulder muscles, get better mo mobility. If you can't do a behind the neck shoulder press, which a lot of people cringe, ah, behind the neck shoulder press, that's bad for you. Not if you have the mobility and the control. Mm -hmm. If you have the mobility and control and you can do it without hurting yourself and everything looks good and form is good and good stability, now you're doing an exercise that's working a different range of motion. If you can't do a full kettlebell press where the kettlebell is sitting on your arm and you're pressing it, rotating it, and coming up real tall, real straight with your arm up, if you can't do that, you're missing out on gains. If you can't do a side lateral, your, your hands come up real high and you can contract those side deltoids. If you can't do a rear fly where you can stop your scapula from moving and increase the mobility of the actual humerus of your arm, so you can isolate the posterior side of your deltoid, you are missing out on gains. So range of motion that you control or good mobility will contribute very strongly and if you don't, to development. And if you don't have it, you don't completely neglect it and say, oh, I can't do that. Or you don't force yourself to do a movement like a, a overhead press because you know we told you That's that a way to hurt yourself. That's how you hurt yourself. You address it. There's That's something right. for you to work on. It's like, hey, I, right now I can't reach completely above my head with my arm next to my ears and straighten it all the way up because mm -hmm. you don't have the capacity. But you can train and develop that. Right. right. Totally. Which is, I mean, this is all a muscular recruitment process. If you think of it like – I need I need strength. I need access. I need help here to be able to produce this movement. I have to intentionally focus on that. So that's something it could be as small as like not even an inch that I have to move the weight. 
But that's that inch is an entirely new exercise. Oh, so great if, point. if I can look at it like that and and, and start incrementally uh, using these angles and and really being intentional with those angles, that's where mobility actually has a lot of you know uh, necessity versus just I'm I'm just trying to mm-hmm. get more flexible. It's not about getting flexible. It's about gaining strength in those ranges of motion. Right. right. So so here's what I strongly recommend for everybody. Um, make mobility a part of your workout for your shoulders. You will develop better looking shoulders. You'll develop more muscle, you get stronger. And then of course, this goes without saying, your risk of injury will go down quite a bit. So I think what we should do is I think we should list off some of our personal favorite totally. mobility exercises to do yeah. before your shoulder workout. Totally. Now, one of my favorites is a simple, basic shoulder mobility movement. It's really easy to do and learn, but it does get your body, your shoulders moving through their full range of motion and it helps you connect to them. And I like this one because it's easy. The reason why I like it is because it's easy. I can have anybody do it and people can stop where their body won't let them move anymore and they can slowly improve their range of motion. I have applied this to all kinds of clients, old clients and young clients. It's an easy one to learn. Shoulder dislocates. Shoulder dislocates. I knew you were going to go. Yeah. That. yeah, it is. The simplicity of it is is definitely something that I, I enjoy. That That's something I could immediately take a client over and we can work on. And we could see, like, it's 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 feedback right away, right? If I'm holding this stick or whatever you're going to use, it, you know, whatever is accessible, um, and to be able to find a range. So if I have to go with my hands really far out on that stick, that's, that's where I'm at. That's where I start. That's where it's easiest. And then I incrementally work my way in uh, to then be able to lift it from my stomach all the way to my lower back without bending my elbows. So that's mm-hmm. that's basically the gist of it while maintaining a nice upright postural position. Yeah, and if you hit a point that you stop at, like you're going behind your head and you're like, oh, I can't rotate anymore. That's okay. That's where you're at. Yeah. Practice within that range of motion. Challenge it just a little bit. And over time, this one... I love the, re- the other reason why I love this one is people improve so quickly on this. And there's hacks to it too. So if you can really work to on gaining more tension. So if I if I squeeze the stick a little bit harder and I pull outward a little bit mm-hmm. on the stick, watch what happens. So yeah, definitely take it piece by piece. Like I said about those inches are important. So I, I agree with that. Um, but I have a one that's even more my favorite, which the handcuff with the rotation. Oh yeah is that hits everything it, that's why and that's why it's my go-to if there's something where i have i'm limited on time that's got to be the most complete one it is I, I know i can get down and do five intense reps of a handcuff with rotation and my fucking shoulders are warm they're yeah. warm they're for sure like just from doing especially if you do it with good intent and you take it to all the in range of motion and really and squeeze and intensify and challenge the the, the movement it is the it's the one mobility uh, movement that I think takes the shoulder through mm. its fullest range of motion in in all planes, and I love that movement. Yeah, and I think and by the way, we'll make sure that there's links to videos of these exercises uh, in, in in our show notes. Um, here's another good one, and I like this one because it also works a little bit on the thoracic mobility. Th- the thoracic part of the spine is kind of that upper part of your back. And mobility in the thoracic spine is going to be important for shoulder mobility. Because remember, the shoulder blade moves over the rib cage. The rib cage moves a little bit. You need all that mobility for good shoulder mobility. Um, thread the needle. Oh, yeah. Thread yeah. the needle. Great movement. Really it, easy to learn, too. Easy to learn. You can have almost anybody do it or practice some version of it. And it involves a little bit of that, 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 scapular, that scapular and thoracic mobility that contributes so well to overall shoulder mobility. It's got to be one of my Yeah, favorites. I think too, like uh, along those lines, reach, roll, lift would be a favorite one of mine oh, yeah. just, just because um, to be able to take uh, your arm and a lot of times we're doing these exercises, especially pressing movements, we're pressing it basically uh, pronated. So, uh, mm. you know, like I, to be able to supinate now my hand and then try and lift and raise and gain access to that and raise it up, it's extremely difficult. It doesn't sound like very difficult, but putting you in this position really highlights that. No, fact. it's incredibly difficult and it has progressions to it, right? Like you, you, in a perfect world, you can get to a point where you can actually do both arms at the same time. I can't even do that. Yeah. I have to independently focus on one side and then the other side 
uh, because it's so challenging, yep. but also one of the best moments. Also, of all the ones that we probably just named, I would say the one that is the most challenging uh, form-wise because I feel like people will cheat with that. Yes. Uh, when I teach that one, I always got to explain the intent of it and how important it is that they keep their chest down mm -hmm. why they do it, and we're just trying to control the shoulder, and it's not about just lifting your arm up because sometimes people look at a movement and they see, oh, lift the hand up off the ground as, right. as high as you can. And so and they start they, to compensate. Right, like they crazy. compensate the rest they of the They don't realize their elbow's bending and then right. lifting, and then their, their thumb's kind of spiraling back because it, it is a lot of torque that you're fighting against because your natural inclination mm -hmm. is to have your hands in that position. Now, right. I would say take – one or two of these movements. If you take one, I'd say handcuffs with rotation. But ideally, you'd want to take two of these movements and spend a grand total of 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay? T just time yourself. Keep your reps slow. You don't need to count the reps. You don't need to do a ton of whatever. Just 10 minutes. Set your timer. For 10 minutes, I'm going to practice these two movements before I go into my workout. They will contribute to better gains, I, for I, sure. I have a little bit of a – because I teach uh, – actually teach all of these uh, in my mobility class when I teach it, I have a little bit of a protocol that I'll, I'll share, uh, even though you're right, Sal. You don't need to count anything, but for somebody who would like some guidance in that, uh, handcuff with rotation is, is, is such a – full range of motion exercise. I do that really slow and controlled and with intent for five complete reps. And I'll do that for two rounds. So five complete reps of taking it all the way through its fullest range of motion, really intense, five times, rest, do it again five times, I move on from that. Yeah, you're, and you're mm -hmm. done in like five to ten minutes. Yeah, if Max. that. If that. It doesn't even take that long. Max. Probably takes three to five minutes tops. Yep. Uh, shoulder dislocates, I do 15 to 20 reps of that. Same. Same thing, two rounds. Same. I do 15 to 20 yeah. reps, relax a little bit, do it again, 15 to 20 reps, move on from that. Thread the needle. I thread through uh, 10 times one direction, 10 times the other direction. I do that two times. Uh, reach, roll, lift. I lift up 10 times, 10 times on each side. I do that for two rounds. And that's that right there. You could, that's a full-on mobility workout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you could actually, you could get, I mean, probably all four of those would take 20 minutes. Yeah. So like you said, take two of them, you're probably done in 10 minutes. Yeah, and I'd say if you have lots of shoulder problems right, and a how, history of shoulder problems. That's how I would decide this. Like if you're yeah. somebody who is just, like if you're, let's say you're someone who's young and you don't deal with any shoulder pain, but you you respect the importance of mobility and you don't want to lose that mobility. And you want to develop better looking shoulders. Right. Yeah. You might be someone that I encourage one or two of these, one to two uh, rounds of it, get through it, just warm yeah. up the shoulders. You do like half the reps and get a nice primer out of it. Right. And and so, and so if you're not doing anything right now, absolutely do this first. You will notice a difference the first time you train it, train your shoulders. 100% you will. Oh, yeah. And you'll get a better pump, better connection. I mean, you're just, you'll see the first time you do it, you'll get that much better. And the workout. more time that you spend, the better the workout will get. So if you're, you're on a, going in on like one of those Saturdays when you got an hour and a half and then you're in no hurry, I challenge those of you listening right now that don't do a lot of mobility work but are interested in developing your shoulders and having very healthy shoulders, do that. Spend 20 minutes. Do all the exercises that we're recommending right now. Take your time. Really wake those shoulders up, get them moving through full range of motion, get really connected to them, and then go do your oh, training man. session. Best workout And ever. I promise it'll be one of your best shoulder workouts that you've ever Absolutely. done. Absolutely. Now let's give them a workout. So you have your 10-minute you know, priming uh, mobility uh, session that you do before your workout. Yeah. Now let's talk about the actual workout itself. So let's, we're going to add some load to this. Yeah, so. now, now we're trying to build the shoulders. Right. We're getting them stronger. We're going to develop them. We're going to build nice, balanced-looking shoulders. Now, I want to, I'm going to start with uh, something that's kind of controversial because I think that any trainer listening right now, um, every, everybody would probably raise their hand and say, you've got to have a shoulder press as like the main... Like a traditional standing overhead press. Yeah, like standing, head, standing overhead press or a seated over press if you want to develop great shoulders. And I would agree with them. But because I think that we have the general population listening to this podcast. And I think, and even Doug was mentioning this before we started this episode today, uh, of, you know, for many years when he was lifting his shoulders, he never felt it really well on his shoulders. And I think that's because when you're pressing over your head, uh, it, very few- So many compensations get in the way. Yes. Very few, few people have a really beautiful standing overhead press. 
uh, including myself, mine was awful. I arched my low back. I couldn't get my hands all the way back by my ears until I started addressing all my mobility. Uh, even being a trainer and lifting for as long as I have, I didn't have a really pretty good looking shoulder press. Um, when I was introduced to the Z press years later, I fell in love with this exercise because it forces you into a good posture and a good, you can't cheat it. Mm -mm. And you have to kind of stabilize at the top, which I think is an area that a lot of people neglect when they do a shoulder yeah, they, press. Yeah, they go up to the top and come right back down. Right. They press up, they come right back down. They go to their end range for them, which yeah. is typically not full extension, and then they come right back down. And I love to teach a Z press with a lockout and stabilization at the top, and then come all the way down to a full range of motion, extend all it. Now, you can't load it as much. So, mm. of course, I'm going to, my trainers, and uh, fitness professionals out there that are going to argue with me that building you build way bigger shoulders, heavy loading, a a, a standing overhead press. Yeah, it's all about the tension, right? Exactly, yeah. and, and the it, range of motion. You're going to develop better shoulders if you go through a fuller range of motion with lighter weight than you will with a heavy. This has been tested, by the way. They've tested this. There was a a bit of a controversy in the '90s where this book came out that talked about uh, the the benefit of load, and and the scientists said, hey. Why don't we just have people lift a shit ton more weight and do partial reps? That should build more muscle. And they tested it, and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Partial reps with more load, even though the tension is high as hell, it's like, okay, I could squat 500 pounds for a half squat. Am I going to build more muscle than if I do a full squat with 300 pounds? No, you mm -hmm. won't. Full range of motion builds more muscle. And the Z-Press encourages, I mean, you can't. You can't not work on that full range of motion, and it means you're going to probably have to start off and really It really hard. highlights the bracing mechanism that has to happen, and that's something that I think a lot of people, unless you – um, you know, you get it right away and, and, and you could teach somebody like how to like properly brace to support their back when anything's overhead. Mm -hmm. It's, it's do or die. You have to learn that before stepping forward. So I like the Z press for that because it, it really, it does, it forces the issue. You can't even get anywhere with it if you're not yeah. like, uh, really summoning and, and activating those core muscles to be able to contribute. And it's an excellent place to start with the intention of eventually progressing to a standing overhead press. So for the, the the fitness professionals that are like, oh my God, how could you not have a standing overhead press as the you know staple best shoulder exercise? I'm going to challenge that and say that 95% of the people will benefit more from doing a Z press first uh, to get the mechanics down really well, run that for like four weeks. And then if you want to replace the Z press with a standing overhead press after you've taught those good behaviors yeah. then i then i see now that. that being said it's you know pressing overhead um if you do a good job pressing overhead with a standing overhead press or an arnold press or a kettlebell press yeah an overhead press is an important aspect of working it's got to be one shoulder. of the main movements yes well and i'm always arguing and so we'll get into this a little bit but uh you know with the arnold press was the first kind of uh, bodybuilder version of adding that rotation in that press, which I really enjoy that, you know, he brought that to popularity mm -hmm. because for me, kettlebell presses are pretty much ideal uh, to get that spiral line type of a press movement to be able to also uh, get that kind of function because your, your, your shoulder is set up to have that type of rotation. And so rotation has to be something considered. Uh, and this is why actually I would start this workout with something uh, we've actually done a video on this on kettlebell halos, but you can also do it with a, a plate, with a plate, a with dumbbell. a dumbbell. So it's it's something that is accessible. It's not like a super unconventional. I, I like that for you know to warm to start before even the press because you kind of it again like the handcuff rotation movement. It really kind of warms up all. You can even use it as a finisher. You can even use it at the end and do some halo, some high sure. rep halos, and you will get a shoulder pump like you've never had. Now this is an, a very it's a lesser known exercise. So a lot of people listening are probably like, "What's this movement?" Yeah. Um, we have a video. We 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 did a, a long time. It was way back in the early days of mind pump. Um, where, where Justin is demonstrating this using a kettlebell. It's an easy exercise to learn, and you can do it with almost any form of free weight resistance. Yeah, this is just, I mean, I'm just very passionate about this in terms of being able to prevent injury and prevent uh, you know further damage so you can keep working out. You can keep building and developing on top of this, you know, th this muscle, and this joint needs to remain healthy. And this is one of those ways it will remain healthy long term is to be able to express uh, you know, that rotation but also add strength to that rotation. So right. halo is is a great one for that. Right. Now, we need to throw 
throw in a reverse fly. I think a reverse fly has to be in there because it's really, in my opinion, the best exercise to work the the, the back of the shoulder, the, the posterior head of the shoulder. It's also extremely, it's neglected constantly. Yes. It's not fun. You don't use a lot of weight doing it. It seems like a small muscle. Why waste time doing it? I don't see it myself anyway. But I'm going to tell you something right now. If you have a very well-developed posterior head of your shoulder, your shoulders look round. They look very, very nice. This is what I was known for in competing, and this also highlights a point that we make on this show um, where um, exercise order – uh, you know, we have these basic rules of like, you know, the, the major compound lifts first or what you can load more barbell wise mm-hmm. typically is first. But here's where I'll make an argument where I would do things a little bit different. When I have a, a client or addressing my own shoulders, which is this is how I did this. And that was the weakest part of my shoulder, uh, not just weakest as far as strength, but also weak the way it looked because it was underdeveloped. I actually started my workout with the reverse fly. I did, I did that for years. So, yep. and this is Same what here. really brought my full. I already had a pretty good anterior delt. I hit laterals a lot, but I really hadn't learned to really target my rear delts well. Once I did, and I really got connected with them, understood the mechanics of it. And there's a really good video that I, I did with Jordan Shallow on this, on the, the proper way to do a reverse fly. We'll link it in there. Once I got that down, then I started to really, I, I wanted all my energy. So I would start my shoulder workout because that's an area of focus. I would start there. And once you, and because I start there, I put, I can, I can go heavier because I have all my energy. And then when I went to those other exercises, I know that it's already burnt a little bit. So it's going to mm-hmm. get even more work when I do the, you know, Z press or the halo and other movements. Right. So keep that in mind, you know, even though the way we're talking about the order of this, you know the priority of what you're trying to build and develop. I may lead with an an area if I'm, especially if I'm aesthetically focused. And this is an exercise that you don't just do the movement. I mean, you can get away with that with certain exercises, like a deadlift, for example. Just do perfect form, follow the movement. It's all about the movement. With the reverse fly, it's all about feeling the muscle. You got to feel this in the posterior head of the deltoid. If you feel this in your mid back or your traps, you're doing it wrong. Yes, you can look almost the same. Uh, but there's small differences in your form that will dictate whether or not you're doing a lot maybe, of rear shoulder. Maybe one of the hardest things to teach, and that's why I referenced that video because I think uh, Jordan does a really good job in that video with me describing uh, how you need to, to to position your body to start that, mm-hmm. to really start to do that, to feel that. And one of the keys, I think I say it in the video, but I know that uh, like uh, I cues that I would give to teach people to feel there is the natural thing for you to do when you see a reverse fly is to fly back. And the cue that I give is to stay forward and fly out. And when you separate the dumbbells. Yes. Yep. 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 So fly out, separate the dumbbells and stay forward and that will use the rear delt versus allowing the traps and the rhomboids to Absolutely. kick. Absolutely. And then of course, we have to throw in your good old-fashioned lateral or as I like to call them, side laterals and you guys make fun of me. <laughs> uh, that's how I learned them in Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. Uh, but side laterals or laterals, bringing the dumbbells out to the sides works the side of the shoulder, the side head, the lateral head of the shoulder. Now, with this exercise, this is an easy one to mess up. Uh, I see a lot of people going for weight on this exercise and developing nice traps but terrible shoulders. So this exercise right here, forget about the weight. This is one of the movements I almost never give a shit about the weight. I will literally – yesterday I worked out and I grabbed 15-pound dumbbells. Almost you lateral, bro. Yeah. I grabbed grabbed 15-pound dumbbells and this. If I wanted to, I could do laterals with 40-pound dumbbells. It wouldn't look the same, but I'd get them done. Well, to the same point that we just made with the rear delts, this is another smaller uh, muscle of the shoulder or smaller part of the shoulder – that it's really easy for other muscles totally. to overcompensate to get it up. And this is a super common one. Everybody has that guy in the gym, the big meathead dude that grabs the 40 pound plus dumbbells and he's doing laterals with it. And he's loud lat- as he's doing these it's laterals. Like a high, it. It's a high clean. Yeah, yeah. You see, you see his shoulders shrugging at the same time and he's getting as much, if not more trap work than he's actually getting. No. Lateral. When you do a lateral, your shoulders, your shoulder structure should stay stable, like locked. Push, that's it. Now, the only thing that's moving is my arm. My arm is bringing the weight out to the side. My palm is constantly facing down. Now, Arnold used to say, 
imagine pouring water out of a glass. But what he's trying to say is keep your palm facing down and keep your elbow up. In fact, if your elbow can stay slightly higher than your hand as you're coming out to the sides, that's probably a little better in terms of feel. But the shoulders should be locked and it should be light. I mean, like again, I could go 40 pounds with this, no problem. I rarely go over 20 pounds because I feel it more when I go lighter and isolate and squeeze. I also recommend that people start the same way with the rear delt tip that we were just talking about too because because it's such a small muscle and it's so easy for other mu uh, uh, muscles to take over. Now, mind you, I, I have gotten to a point where I can actually lift pretty damn good weight. I can actually rear fly 40-pound dumbbells that's been years of me connecting that. I started with like 10 pound. Mm. I started with 10 pound dumbbells and really learning to get connected and use that. Uh, over time, I've worked my way up to be able to do really heavy weight. But always when I'm teaching those movements, both the laterals and the rear delt flies, even, no matter how experienced of a lifter you think you are, I always teach it first with light weight first to really get the technique And down. again, I can't stress this enough. Greater ranges of motion with control will develop better shoulders. Okay, so let's talk about rep ranges and frequency. Now, studies will show that the best frequency to train body parts is around two to four days a week. So in my experience, I agree with that. In my experience training clients, training myself, it's about two to three days a week is what I found. Four days a week if you're really advanced. But about two to three days a week is how often you should hit a body part, and the shoulders are no different. So if it's three days a week, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday routine involving the exercises that we just listed with that mobility, with the mobility movements that we talked about, you would get probably great development. As far as rep ranges are concerned, all rep ranges uh, build a lot of muscle, um, anywhere between one to 25 reps. I recommend, we typically recommend staying within a particular range for a few weeks, get used to that rep range. So if you're in the lower rep ranges, six reps or so, that's fine. Do that for a few weeks and then move to a new rep range to prevent your body from, from plateauing. That being said, I will say this. We talked about reverse flies and laterals, both of which tend to not be very good uh, for low reps. They just don't, they're not, yeah. they're not, they don't lend themselves well to low repetitions. I rarely Rarely, I'll go the lowest I'll go with a rear with the reverse fly and a lateral is eight reps. Yep, anything lower than that, and it starts to get too heavy, and I start to use muscles that I'm not necessarily trying to work. So keep that in mind. That's just from my own experience. You may be one of those mm -hmm. rare people that can do five reps with perfect form. No, I'm the same way. Even d rear delts, laterals, I don't think I ever drop below eight to 10 reps. Yeah. It's, all, mm -hmm. it typically it's usually like around 12. 12, yeah. yeah. It's eight usually 12 around 12. Sort of a sweet spot. Yeah. So there you go. There's your full workout. You have your mobility component. We, we have already made the case for the shoulders and why, how, why you need to work them a particular way. You have your mobility component. You have your exercises that we recommend. You could do the ones we recommend or versions of them. I'll recommend that you stick to the ones that we told you uh, because we've been doing this a long time. We know what we're talking about, but variations of them will work fine also. Stick within a particular rep range for a few weeks and train your shoulders between two to three days a week and uh, watch what happens. Well, not to mention that. This is also, I don't know if you guys know this. I'm always looking at uh, numbers and tracking what's happening on the backside of our business. Um, our number one uh, most downloaded free guide is actually our shoulder guide. Oh, yeah. So those of you that uh, are wanting more, uh, it's completely free. It's at our uh, mindpumpfree.com. You can download the guide. There's even more information in there uh, pertaining to what we're talking about yeah, right now. Yeah, it's called the, uh, the the guide to developing or to building big shoulders. Uh, mindpumpfree.com. Download it. And then also, uh, if you want videos of all the stuff that we discussed, uh, if you go to our uh, podcast page. Uh, it's a, you can find it at mindpumpmedia.com. Under the show notes, there should be links to all the exercises and us uh, demoing these exercises. You can also find us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.